Well, this is the first time I get to preach since, you know, this whole COVID crisis has happened. Has it shaken your world a little bit? Things feel a little different? Does it feel like the whole world has changed and we've all got to figure out, like, what the new normal is? What, what is the new normal? Are we ever going to get to hug each other? I know, you're all thinking about that, right? Isn't it so weird that we get to, we get to come to church, which, I mean, okay, this is amazing. So let's just, we've got to follow the rules. We got to be on our best behavior. We got to do it because I love being in this building and I love singing and worshiping with y'all. And I just, I love it all. But no hugging? Are we ever going to get to do it again? I mean, how long is this going to take? When will it end? And has the world just changed forever? I mean, how many of these, you know, leadership guru types, these futurists, these people who are trying to forecast our future are talking about the new normal, right? That this is going to change everything fundamentally. You know, there won't be offices anymore, but then there will be offices. And you remember how all of the millennials and all the startups were taking away all the cubicles? Well, now we're going to put the cubicles back in. We're going to put them all back up. Everybody's got to have walls so we can't be sneezing on each other. So we're going in these cycles, and and does anybody really know what's about to happen? I hear so many different things, so many conflicting stories, and honestly, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Do you feel a sense of certainty? Or you may be a little bit like me, where you kind of feel anxious, and, you know, it just, who knows, right? And every day it seems to change. Each day is different. It's new. So, I mean, we're, we're in the middle of this study about changed lives, which is excellent, right? We're talking about the apostles, like we're in the middle of a changed world as well. And I think that this is a great series for us to look at. And we're going to look at the life of Paul. We're actually going to start a three-part series because there's so much in the Saul-Paul story. You know, he had such a profound impact on the entire New Testament and just the way that the gospel spread out from Israel. But what's his real story about, right? Maybe you know the story. So Saul is persecuting the Christians. He's even there at the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He's standing there, nodding in approval, feeling all righteous. So then he goes out, and he's actually like, you know what? We need to go and find more of these Christians because they've all kind of spread out and left. So we got to go after more. And so he goes out on a road, and on the road, this blinding light comes, paralyzes him, blinds him, and Jesus shows up and actually talks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's blinded for three days. He goes to a temple to pray where God sends a prophet to go to pray for him, to heal him, to bless him, to change his life radically forever, to introduce the Holy Spirit and baptism to him. And he become, he goes from Saul the persecutor to Paul the prophet like Jesus. The most radical transformation in the whole gospel. And honestly, I got a heart for Paul because he was, like he thought he was the best of the best, and at the same time he was the worst of the worst. You know, as he's nodding at the approval of killing these Christians, I mean, he thought he was the best of the best, maintaining the faith, keeping it pure, Think from Paul's perspective. You know, he was part of this church hierarchy, and he said, you know what? If you think of the people of Israel, you remember all the problems we got ourselves into when we worshiped all these other gods and all these other things? So he feels like he's defending the people and defending the faith. Oh, doesn't it feel good to have that righteous fire within you? Paul's just a fiery personality. I like that. But what's this real story about? Is it about conversion, right? Is it about maybe a little bit about repentance? Or is possibly the story of of Saul really about something else entirely? That's what I want to look at. But first I want to talk about being in a changed rule, being in a changed world, and talking about where that intersects with the life of Saul. And we're going to say Saul today. We're going to stay in the Saul camp for today's terminology. So we're going to keep going with the series. How does that relate to this changed world? the world we live in. Well, I can give you one really easy example. Rules. How many people, how many of you are my rule lovers? Don't be shy. Come on. Love the rules. Everybody needs to follow the rules. Why do we have problems in this world? Because nobody's following the rules. And if they would follow the rules, everything would be okay, right? But I know some of you, and you are not rule people at all, right? I hate rules. How dare you? You know, tell me nothing, right? There's something about that, and we see that playing out everywhere. You know, we see it politically, we see it societally, like it's everywhere right now. 
Should we wear a mask or don't wear a mask? Oh, do you feel that tension in the room? Oh, that's good. Love it. What about, uh, do we lock down or do we don't lock down? I mean, that tension is not only in this room between us at times, right? But it's, I mean, it's out there local, like our local government right now. You know, I work in the city of Houston, and then like between the city of Houston and the judges and then the, the, uh, the governor, nobody seems like they're on the same page, you know? So nobody can even agree what the rules are. But man, I'll tell you about Saul. This is somebody who loved the rules. Saul was a rule follower. And what happens if you don't follow the rules? You get what's coming to you, right? But I like the story of Saul because there's something in this story that's really, I don't know, it's encouraging, it's hopeful. Like if God can change the life of somebody like Saul, I mean really, the guy who's killing and persecuting the church and the early Christians, like if God can change that life, what can't he change? And so in chapter 9, in verse 3 and 4, Jesus appears in a brilliant light. It blinds everybody, right? But there's this light that is not there to scare him into obedience. It's actually there to reveal a plan to, to Saul, that there is a calling on his life. It's not just blind him and so he, now he's so frantically scared. Oh, God's so powerful. What he's doing is God is actually revealing a plan, and what he's doing is he's changing course. He's helping him change direction. And I think that that is a very specific message we need to listen to in the church today. Because it's really not about rules right now. And I hate to break this to you, but nobody has the answers we're looking for. Right? The hope for humanity will never come from a government. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I know it's a bold statement, (laughs) probably a divisive statement. I'm okay with that. (laughs) But, you know, our hope comes from God in this amazing, transforming, life-changing thing that he can do, and then that swells up. And really, it's this inverted pyramid that Paul operates in that Jesus preached about. Because the role of these visions in Acts is never really conversion. In fact, if you read through the book of Acts, conversion happens through preaching more often than not. And there's only a few visions, and and during these visions, it's actually about a commissioning to go out as this mission to spread the gospel into the world. So there's this missional aspect, there's this calling, there's this this commissioning of that God is giving to Saul as he completely 180s his entire life. And I think that that's really important because, you know, right now, for those of you who don't know that my day job, by day, um, I'm actually a retail manager. And I don't know if you know this, probably all of you have been shopping already. So as you can tell with stores, you know it's not normal operations. It is not business as usual right now, right? Every single day, I think things change. Things are in a constant state of flux. Well, now we can do this. Now we can't do that. Well, then we're going to do this. But when can we do it? Well, we're going to do it next week. No, actually, it's going to be two weeks. Scratch that. It's going to be tomorrow. Within the span of 24 to 48 hours, I have to be ready to radically change everything that I'm doing. Do you all feel like that's happening right now? Yeah? Within 48 hours. So one of the things I talked to my team about is I said, look, here's the thing. What's going to happen? Now, it's my job to know what's going to happen. I am the plan holder. I'm supposed to have the plan to make the rules to tell everybody what to do. So they're all looking at me saying, okay, well, what do you want us to do? I have no idea. There's, I mean, and no one knows. So what I told them, I said, look, instead of us trying to think about what's next, what's the plan, how can we prepare for a, mo- a week, two weeks? I mean, heaven forbid a month. Come on, like a month? Who knows? No tell. I said, you know what we need to do is we need to just stay flexible, and we just need to be ready to pivot. And that's the word that I've just been leaning on. And I think we see in the life of Saul that God has just this, I mean, archetypal, just this, this perfect example of a pivot, where he just changes his path. Saul sets out on one path, and he ends up going to a completely different one. Because really what Saul, it's not just that there's a blinding light, it's not just that there's this supernatural power that just kind of smacks him around. What we're talking about is a personal encounter with the living Jesus. And it's personal when you read the story, right? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus, notice that Jesus, he said, it says he sees Jesus, and it says, notice that it doesn't say, why are you persecuting these followers? Why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting Christians? What Jesus says is, why are you persecuting me? Saul, why are you persecuting me? He just takes all of the political divisiveness, all the rules and regulations, 
all of the contextual protocols that they're all wrapped up and bound in, he takes it all off the table and just says, it's you, it's me, what are you doing? Just cuts right to the core of him. It's about me, not them. And so in this radical thing that happens, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's blind, he can't see. And the next little chunk I'd like to point your attention to here is, so they led him by the hand. I'd like you to consider some other characters in this story. Saul was not alone. He had people with him. I would like to ask, what are these people? Are they his team? His followers? His entourage? His gang? No. It's a posse. Right? Saul has this, and he's going out looking for Christians. Why? Because he's hunting. Saul is hunting Christians. He's left home base. He's on the road. He's taking people with him. Saul's got a posse, and he is out for blood, right? So as they go down the road, Jesus comes, confronts him, blinds him. He can't see. I'd like for you to consider the perspective of the people that are with him. Think of the hired hands here, okay? Think of the group of people. We don't know how many people, but let's say three, five minimum, right? Like there's a group with him, and they're all stunned speechless, yeah? They hear the voice, but they don't see anybody. And Saul is blinded, so they lead him by the hand. Now, I'd like for you to just consider what has just happened in this whole passage. Not only has Jesus come, radically engaged Saul, made it super personal, stripped away all the context, so it's already really rattling for all these people involved, especially Saul, right? Blind, can't see anything, just met Jesus, realized everything he's been doing is incorrect. It's all wrong. Wow, I had it totally wrong. But what about these people that are with him? How would you feel, right? Okay, imagine you're in the posse, right? All right, let's get these Christians. Let's go. We're hunting, right? And you go out, and then this happens, and you're just sitting there like, whoa, what happened to the guy who had all the answers? What happened to this guy with the pedigree? Saul had a pedigree. I mean, he was the best of the best in terms of training. He was high up in the church hierarchy. The guy who had all the answers, what happened? He's blind. He can't even see where he's going. Andy, I mean, who knows what Saul was actually saying? I'm sure he was babbling and just completely disoriented, you know, not just from not being able to see, but, you know, in his head, psychologically. I mean, imagine what it's like for those people just standing there, and then they have to, like, okay, so instead of you riding out with the posse to go get, you know, these Christians, instead, we'll come along, let's grab them by the hand, let's, let's lead him where we need to go. Let's take him to the temple where God says. So, I mean, how different is that? I mean, you talk about a world getting flipped upside down really quick. I mean, that has happened here. And so, if you fast forward a little bit, you go to verse 13 and 14, and Ananias, God appears to Ananias and says, you know, I need you to go. I need you to talk to Saul. You're going to pray for him. He's going to be my instrument to the known world. This guy is going to suffer for the gospel. He's the one I've chosen, and I need you to go over there. And Ananias says, "Uh, you know, I've heard about that guy. I think it says, actually, many people have told me about this guy. Like, not just I heard a thing. Like, I've heard from a lot of people. Like, he's well known. This man is notorious. Saul is notorious. You know, I've heard about this man. And then he says, you know, I know about how much evil he's done to your saints. This man is arguing with God, saying, like, God, um, I've heard about this guy. You know he's real bad, right? It says he has authority to bind all who call on your name. Because it's one of the things Saul was out to do, is he wanted to bind up the Christians, throw them on the back of the horse and bring them back. Tie them up. Hog tie them and bring them back to town. That was the goal. It says he has the authority from the church and the hierarchy, and he, he's here to bind everyone who calls on your name. Uh, like God didn't know? Hey, God. Yeah, you know, that, you know that's a bad guy, right? Are you sure you want him? <laughs> Are you sure? That guy? Saul? Really? But it just goes to show you how radical that this event is, that he says, like, hey, wait, I've heard about that guy. I mean, this is inconceivable. Um, consider the perspective of Ananias here, right? Like, that's the guy you want? Remember, nodding in approval at the martyr. He's out hunting. How angry do you have to be to get out and go hunting? Right? Just see then in his anger, Saul was. 
And then in verse 17 and 18, Ananias shows up, prays, and Saul becomes filled with the Holy Spirit. His sight is restored, and it says that something like scales falls from his eyes. He rises, and he's baptized. And in this moment, it's a game-changing moment for Saul because everything is so new and different, and now all of a sudden, like, he gets it. And in fact, as you fast forward to verse 20 and 21, it says, he immediately goes to the synagogue and proclaims Jesus. He is the Son of God. And everyone was amazed. Wasn't this the guy that was trying to bind up all the Jesus followers? Again, there's that word. This is the guy who wanted to tie everybody up, to lock them down, to hunt them down, to bring them to justice because they weren't following the rules. And this is Saul going back to the synagogue. I mean, he has, you know, position. He has authority. He is known. He's not only notorious among the Christians, he is known among everybody. So he goes back to his home base. I mean, this would be like, I don't know, the president or something, right? Coming back into the White House, okay? Like, and, and just goes in there and radically does something, just 180. I mean, this is, like, it's hard to find an equivalent of Saul being that high up in the church, going in and say, hey, yeah, that thing that we all agree on, that we're all, like, rock solid about, we're killing people over here. Oh, by the way, completely wrong. That guy's actually the son of God. I saw him, right? He, you know, I was baptized. I, I experienced the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been with them. And I mean, what a position to be in. How, can you imagine that? And what we learned from the life of Saul, right? The son of God, and he really just, he boldly proclaims this. And you're going to see this in our next series as we talk about the life of Paul and, and how much he affects all of the ministry and the gospel going out from Israel, going into the Gentile world, going everywhere, that the gospel's on a move. So again, it's not just a bright light that blinds Saul, some kind of a supernatural event that just, wow, that was really bright. I mean, we're talking about this is the institution of a calling. It's about a mission of the gospel going out, and Paul is actually commissioned. He's called to a missionary task. He goes from Saul the persecutor to Saul the prophet like Jesus. What an amazing transformation. So what can we learn about Paul? You know, he suffered. He suffered a lot. There were beatings, locked in prison. He went from the best of the best to the worst of the worst. The reason why Paul's writings, he could talk about grace so well, about forgiveness, about all these ideas that go with the Christian faith is simply because he'd experienced so much of it. You know, Paul sought to, he wanted to bind, he then wanted to bind the right things. Instead of going to bind the Christians, Saul, he, he talks about binding up, you know, like the flesh and sin and idolatry and these things that actually lock us back up in prisons. I think some of the, the most profound elements of Paul's writing is when he talks about how he talks about freedom in a way that's like real, in a way that has real practical applications for us, where we see it that it's living free. It's about going and doing something. It's not just about knowing the right ideas and the right concept, knowing all the rules and following all the rules. It's actually about living this thing out. You see, for Paul, he gets it into his heart. He had clarity. I mean, so much clarity. And I don't know about you, but I find myself most often praying for clarity. That word just always comes back to me, just that I can just see things clearly for where I'm at, that I just know where people are and the, what's the right thing to do, God, that I can see the situation for what it really is and not in light of all of the stuff that's just getting churned up within me. I want to see clearly. and I think Paul really did. But it's all because he found a personal relationship. He encountered the real, living person of Jesus. You know, a lot of people are talking about what are we going to do in this new world that we're in? Everything's new. Everything's different. What are we really going to be doing here? And I don't know. Is it, is it our job to have the answers? I mean, if we just follow all the rules, are we going to, we're going to be okay, right? Is that, is that where we're going to kind of place our hope for the future? If we can just lock it in, you know, if we just do the right things, we can argue enough, and we'll finally get to the right spot, and then we just make everybody follow the rules. Does that sound simple? 
and we're going to be fine. I just don't think that that's, that's the way that God wants to work. And if we think about what's happening in our world today and talking about like new normal and all these other things, God has just disrupted everyone. Just, I mean, those of you who thought you knew the game, there's no game. The game is gone, right? And I hate to say it, but how often does this even affect, I mean, this even affects us in the church sometimes, right? Like, well, you know, I can show up. I can kind of do the right things. I can go through the motions. I know the right things to say. I know the right things to, you know, the way to appear to people, to respond to people, to kind of keep them at bay. What I post on social media, very crafted, very manicured, so everybody thinks the right things about me. I got the game, and I never have to be raw and real with anybody. Maybe I just got the game down. God says, nah, none of that stuff's actually going to work. Game's out the window. Maybe you thought that that translates to your career. Well, I mean, most companies are disrupted whether we're talking about real-life things of, you know, there's layoffs, there's furloughs, there's downsizing, there's relocation, there are RIF, and if you don't know what that is, it's a really scary term, reduction in force. Nobody wants to talk about that. I mean, these are all real-world things that are happening right now, and if you thought you had the game (laughs) down at work, you don't. That's a lot of uncertainty for us to wrestle with right now. And maybe, you know, unfortunately that can be even at church. It could be at work. It could be at school. But just like the life of salt, like the game changed, the world's different. Everything is just not what we thought it was. And guess what? It's not going to be so easy to just manage, which means, I hate to break this to you, just following the rules will not get us where we need to be. Crafting the perfect plan and getting what I call an illusion, consensus with everyone, that everyone agrees on something. Just getting that all locked in will not necessarily solve our problems. Saul going out and saying, I just need to get people to follow the rules because we can get uniformity, if we can get people to follow what we've said, it'll all be okay. And I don't think any of that stuff is really actually the answer. What I do think is the answer is a personal relationship with Jesus because we're not called to, to draft a plan. We're not called to figure it out. Now, does that feel good to you, or does that feel a little scary? Let me phrase it another way. You know, as leaders in the church, we're saying, what does the church look like now? This whole thing is really, I mean, it's messed things up, honestly. I know other pastors. They pastor large congregations with hundreds of people every Sunday. I mean, I kind of wonder how much, like, honest pastoring they're doing. A lot of the time, I think they're program managers, Right? They manage programs. Every single program got shut down. And so now we're all asking the question, well, what's the future of the church? And the kind of like anxiety these people have, right? I mean, these are amazing people, first of all. But the weight that they carry to feel like they have to have the answers, like they have to draft a plan. I have to think of this new, radical, amazing, perfect, flawless idea the pressure that comes with that is just crushing. And that's not the gospel. It's not. What the gospel says is we're actually just called to walk with Jesus. We're called to follow Jesus. So when I go in in a very, you know, sanitized work setting and tell everybody we need to learn to pivot, (laughs) doesn't that just sound like a corporate buzzword? I know what it is. I'm under no illusion. We got to pivot, y'all. So when I say that, I mean, isn't that another way to just say we have to be flexible and adaptable? Why can't that work in the church? Why can't our mission right now in the world to be to follow Jesus, and when he redirects our life, even if it's like Saul where it's the complete 180, be willing to walk with Jesus? I think that's, you know, how things are going to be okay. Like, what else is going to give you a sense of peace? What else is going to help you feel like there's some stability, some security where we are right now with this whole crisis thing, when things are up in the air, when you got to learn to just tear up your whole plan in 48 hours and completely do something brand new? The only thing that brings me any peace is that we're going to keep walking with Jesus and we're going to follow him, and that is my goal, and that is what I'm here for. You know, God's still in control. God knows what we're dealing with. He knows where you are right now. He knows how you feel right now. There's a lot of real stuff happening where people are 
I mean, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's anger. Like, I mean, that's not easy stuff. And that's not just an idea. Like, this is real world. And God's saying, I'm going to walk with you, and we're going to get there. And um, you don't get a plan. (laughs) Sorry. You're not going to get one. Everybody okay with that? You good? Not going to get a plan? It's going to be okay? We're going to keep walking with God because Jesus has a plan for us. You know, I am a Christian because I believe that Jesus is really alive. I'm not a Christian because it's proper. If you know me, and my wife will tell you very much, I don't do things just to be proper. Not at all. <laughs> I got a touch of that you know tell me stuff from my uh... <laughs> But that's not why I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian because Jesus has really shown up in very real ways to me. And I know I've talked to some of you about these real life encounters with Jesus. Was it just the light that snapped you out of that funk you were in? That nasty, desperate spot? I mean, I know I've heard stories of some of you that in times of prayer that Jesus is there. And that Jesus shows you that he's there. I mean, how amazing is that? Like, that's not just some nice idea. That's not some nice, fuzzy feeling. That is the real presence of Jesus being right there with you. I can say if you've experienced something like that, man, it's transformative. And isn't that nice to have that little moment? Maybe you never did, though. Maybe you follow rules, right? Maybe you weren't a troublemaker like me. Good for you. Good job. Well done. And there's, you know, we still need to have a a faith and a tradition that allows for us to groom people that do follow rules, and that's great. So it's not all just like radical conversion experiences. It's going to be both. We've got people that have done a fantastic job of being able to follow the rules in their life. I commend them. I wish I was one of those people. It would have saved me a lot of heartache. But I know Jesus is going to walk with both of us. But it's because it's personal, that that light is Jesus, right? And that's that's part of my story. I know that's part of a lot of your stories, too. And you may have a time in the future where you look back on parts of your life and you know Jesus was right there with you. You know, we're Christians not only because Jesus is actually alive, but because personal transformation, right, is the goal and the aim. It's what we see so archetypal in Paul. He's the best example. I mean, if if the worst of the worst, I didn't think he was the best of the best, I thought he was the worst of the worst. If the worst of the worst can get better, be saved, and become, I mean, wow, what an amazing legacy he leaves behind. Oh, and he suffers, by the way. Don't forget, yeah, what God said to Ananias, he will suffer, absolutely. He gets beat, thrown in prison and in chains. He's not phased by it anymore. I mean, do you love the irony here? Like, he was the one going out to bind up people to put them into chains. Now he's the one talking about how to actually be free. But I think a message about personal transformations, we need to continue to do that, but it cannot just fall into like a sanctified self-absorption. You like that? Big words? Sanctified self-absorption. It means we also have a duty that we, have, we need to be compelled to go and take care of other people around us. God is here and has changed my life radically, but it's not so I can just kind of sit around and just look in the mirror and go, wow, that was really great, wasn't it? That was really awesome. It's for a purpose. It's for a mission. There's action in that salvation. God's restored my life, made me brand new, has really healed me in some pretty profound and amazing ways, has made me a whole person and human being again. Why? so I can just sit and revel in it? God's made me that way so that I can go and help other people to try and find the same thing. And if there's any way we can do that, we should be trying to do that right now. The church as a light in the world, our job is to tell people about personal relationship with Jesus, that Jesus is alive. And that's why we're Christians. That's why we have hope. That's why I'm not worried about the plan that everybody's arguing about that no one's ever going to agree about. And that's going to change in 48 hours because I know the plan is not ultimately going to be the answer for who's taking care of me, where my safety, security, and hope lies. But it's about action, it's about mission, it's about service. So the conversion experience that Saul experiences, it's really preparing him for mission, for calling. And I think as God saves each one of us, there is a mission and a calling, and it can be really small ways that you talk to people, the way that you share your faith with people, there's a lot of opportunity to do that right now because there's a lot of fear out there.
So if you're just going through the motions or you thought you had the game, man, this is quite a time. If you thought you had the game figured out, there's no more game. There's no more going through the motions. All right. But also, what are you binding? One of the most amazing things, I think, in the life of Saul is that he learns to bind the right things. Right? Binding evil, right? Like, our job is to pray against the things that put people in prisons. In fact, those things can be bound and given to the throne of Jesus because he's the one in ultimate authority and control. And that, that fact right there gives me security. You know, Saul was bound. He was stuck in life. The anger, the seething anger he experienced, fear, anxiety, you know, all of these things are cages. They're cages that lock you up. And part of the gospel message, the good news for all, the real living Jesus here in our midst, that's the good news is that I, I'm not bound to the cage. Like, I'm free. And so I think there's something to say, like, you know, what's God calling you to? You know, it's living a life of grace and forgiveness. What do you do with this kind of a message? So what's, the, what's some practical application, right? It's sharing your faith with people, I think, is one thing. But what God's calling you to in this time, and maybe it's an awakening of some sort, maybe it's a reawakening of some sort, God wants to really encounter you. God really wants you. What, like, my goal here is just to surrender my life in a daily way to Jesus. Every day I want God guiding my steps. In every interaction that I have, that is my sole goal. Because I think as we do those things, God is going to show up, and you're going to see God in the lives of those around you. And ultimately, that's how I think we all, you know, get over this whole thing. So if you're asking me, like, what's the certainty in the world? Am I worried? Am I concerned? Yeah, I think people are struggling with some really very real things that we should not dismiss. But at the same time, I know God's still in control. I know that God is still here for me personally. And just like in the life of Saul, God can just do that 180. So I'll just keep pivoting. And we're going to go this way. So what's the future of the church for us? We're going to continue just as we are now. We're here, right? In a slightly modified fashion. It won't be six feet forever, y'all. You can hug. We're going to get there, okay? Just hang in there. Be strong. We will get there. But it's going to be in a new way, a new fashion, a new shape. You know, and they may change our rules next week. We may be wearing masks, people. And guess what? We're going to do that. Why? Because we can still go to church. We can still gather, and we're still going to be okay. So, you know, my message and my, my prayer for you, I'm going to have Pastor pray for us here. You know, my message is trust in Jesus, look for him in those moments, and just know that, like, Jesus is really there. It's not some concept. It's not some ideology. It's not some political stance. It's not a way to just be proper and follow the rules. God's goal for you and his invitation to you is to really sit with him, to really encounter him, for you to really get to know the living Jesus, and we're going to be okay.